Hi, welcome to another edition of North Shore Journal. I'm your host, Walt Kosmowski, and I'd like to introduce my guest today, Miranda Ashleen, correct? Yes, thank you. And Miranda is with Miranda's Hearth, mm -hmm. and uh, Miranda is uh, an artist and an entrepreneur and a business owner, and we're going to kind of talk about all of those things that she's involved in. Um, and uh, Maybe to introduce uh, uh, yourself to our audience, Miranda, you can talk a little bit about your, your background, your educational background, and your art background, and maybe as you do that, we can have slide number one up as, as you tell us about that. All right. Sounds great. So as you mentioned, I'm an artist. I'm trained as an abstract oil painter and a potter, but I've dabbled in a little bit of everything as you do while you move through the art world. <laughs> so I got my bachelor's in painting and pottery down in Virginia, and then I came up to Boston to study at Lesley University, and I did their Master's of Education and Community Art program. Uh, and actually, one of my mentors there was Kit Jenkins, who's the, one of the founders of Raw Artworks out in Lynn. Right, and we know them very well. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah they do. Absolutely wonderful work. And, uh, and she was the first one who really helped push me into the community arts field and into, into founding my own business. Yeah. So, yeah. And speaking about your own business, we'll yeah. have this slide number two. This is called Miranda's Hearth. And before you tell us about um, uh, how you got started, tell us about what, why, why hearth? I think I know, but I want you to tell why hearth? Why Miranda's Hearth? What is that supposed to convey? Sure. Well, there are two parallels. The first is the literal translation, which is that a hearth is the center of a home. Right. It's where people belong. It, it emanates warmth and welcoming, and I think those are things that we need more of in yeah. our culture. Yeah. And then there's also, just for the fun aesthetics, the literal spelling of the word. Yeah. The word hearth has the word art, earth, and uh, here, all exactly in it. And heart. And heart. Yeah. <laughs> so yep. it's got everything in there, doesn't it? It's got it? everything you need right inside the word, right which there, I think yeah. is a wonderful metaphor yeah, in and of itself. Fantastic. Now, so tell us a little bit about uh, when you started uh, Miranda's Hearth and kind of uh, start from there and kind of bring us up to, the, up to the present. Sure. So I started it right after I finished my degree at Leslie in community art, and I knew I wanted to start an art center. And um, throughout my trajectory, I've looked at where I am and the experience that I have and looked at where I wanted to be. So I knew I wanted to start a community art center, um, but I didn't have any business experience at that point. Yeah. So I took a job as an office manager at the Umbrella Community Art Center in Concord, Massachusetts. Yeah. And over the course of four years, I worked from office manager to director of operations. Right. And while I was gaining that business experience, I started my business with the people first. Right. Because that's what I'm trained in. I'm trained as an educator, as a community organizer. And so we started just with events, yeah. with so, bringing people together. Yeah. So let's see the next slide there. And you can tell us it was July 2013, I think. That's uh, right. Uh, and we'll look at that slide. So, so tell us about uh, uh, you started out with just a, a what minimum number of people? Oh yeah, four people in a jam session in my apartment in July 2013. Yeah. And from then we've grown over the past five and a half years. We've served 25,000 people yeah. through creative programming events and through talking to all of those people. I've done my research. You know, yeah. what do people need? How do people come together? What art activities? What creative experiences really create connection right. between people? And yeah. what you know doesn't communicate as well. Yeah. And you are you are going to uh, be doing some activities here in Beverly, and quite a few activities, I believe, uh, during this current year, 2019. Tell us a, a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. So we first started programming in Beverly last July. We mm -hmm. brought up a tiny house, which we might talk about a little later. We'll talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so we brought that up as a public art installation, and 1,300 people toured it, and that was really my first public interaction with the community of Beverly. Um, and then in January, we started doing creative community nights. And so over the five and a half years of iterations of learning what does and doesn't work, I have found that consistency really matters. I think consistency is the core of community building. And so having a weekly event, a weekly place where people know yeah. that they can go and they'll be welcomed and they don't need to check. We're there every single week on Thursdays from 6 to 8. And you just come, you bring an art project, you bring a work project. You bring dinner. There's yeah. one of our community members brings Domino's pizza every single week. And Except he just he sits can. there and eats <laughs> and chats. And, you know, I think we don't have enough spaces like that. Yeah. So we've been really enjoying offering that in Beverly. We're at uh, Waring Downtown, which is a storefront in the Cabot that's rented out by the Waring School. Ah, okay. And they've been a wonderful uh, partner with us, letting us use their space. Right, okay. Now, you mentioned uh, uh, Umbrella 
Community Arts Center. And I want to yes. bring up the next item. And I'd like you, I'd like you to tell us the concept here, because this, this segues right into what your proposal for the city for, for the city of Beverly is. So tell us about the uh, Umbrella uh, Community Arts Center in Concord. Sure. So the Umbrella is an organization that's been around for 36 years. It was founded in 1983. And it was founded by a group of really passionate, dedicated artists uh, who came together and they saw what at that point had been an empty high school for about 10 years or more. And there were literally stalactites growing from the ceiling of the theater. So we're putting together a similar proposal for Briscoe Middle School. And to me, there are no stalactites, so Briscoe looks great. <laughs> you know, because I talked to all these artists who, when they first founded the umbrella, um, there was no heat, and so they wore gloves, fingerless gloves, <laughs> while they were painting, while they were chis- and they swapped. Chiseling their, car- their, their yep. granite, right. Yep. And there are, what, about 50-some artists in there? There are 55 artists in the umbrella. Yeah. It's a 40,000-square-foot building. Yeah. Um, and what's fascinating to me and what I really took away from it is that in the four and a half years that I worked there, I was in charge of studios and renting, and there was about turnover of maybe one studio every year and a half. Yeah, which is and significant. We'll talk about absolutely. that. We'll talk about that yeah. again. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you paid a pretty high rent to be there, didn't you? Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> I caught you there. Yes, you did. So, so, yeah, that's so the, the umbrella rents the uh, building, the Emerson High School is the old building, yeah. from the town of Concord for a dollar a year. For a dollar a year, and that, that's yeah. the model. And that's really what makes it possible. And there's a lot of precedent for that throughout Massachusetts and actually throughout the country. Right. So let's let's uh, segue now to the arts space Maynard, and we can see the next slide if I can get the controller to put that up. Tell us about Artspace uh, Maynard. Uh, sure. Maynard. So Artspace Maynard was actually founded by one of the former executive directors of the Umbrella. You know, it's a small world. His name is Jero Neeson, and he actually also worked down at 249A Street in Fort Point. So he's done a lot of work, and I've been really thankful to sit down with him and get his advice on this project. But it is specifically an old middle school in Maynard, Massachusetts. The city did not know what to do with it. Yeah. It was run down. Yeah. Uh, it had 55000 square feet and what they did is they actually got a hundred percent pre-commitment from interested artists right. before they even had the building and then used that to say this is the need and we can fill and it we can fill it yeah. and they did so it started in 2001 and they've been going for about 18 years yeah. at this point and they also pay that exorbitant rent don't they, they do they also you know really dig through their checkbooks to pay a dollar a year for the lease to the town the, so now let's let's fast forward and uh, you made a proposal uh, to the city council uh, for the repurposing of the Briscoe School. As our, our viewers know, the city, the, uh, the, the middle school now is on uh, Cabot Street, the mm-hmm. b- new middle school that was been occupied now. This will be the first year, finishing mm-hmm. up in June. But the Briscoe now is empty, mm-hmm. and uh, there is an RFP out by the city. Uh, for, well, it's not out yet. Well, that's right. But, but there, yeah, it's not out yet, but there will be an RFP. But Correct. you've made a presentation to the city mm-hmm. to repurpose uh, Briscoe. And the, the, the the two projects we just talked about in, in uh, Concord and Maynard, sort of you use that as a template for that. So let, let's put up the next uh, slide here, the BevArt. So talk about uh, this, Miranda. Sure. So we want to do the exact same thing. It works so well in those towns. And I think old school buildings are best used as new art centers mm-hmm. because the light, the space, the high ceilings, there's usually a lot of community space in Briscoe Middle School. There's that beautiful auditorium, uh, which we would want to use as a, as a function hall. We'd plan to take out the seats and tier the floor so that you could have big event functions in there. Mm-hmm. Um, But what we want to do is repurpose this entire building. We estimate that we could put 150 to 200 artists in Mm -hmm. Briscoe Middle School uh, and turn it into BevArt, which would really tie the arts community in Beverly together. So so hold that thought. I'm going to ask the control room to put up the next slide, which is uh, BevArt, and tell us about... um, Okay, tell us about this little wheel with an empty center. Sure, sure. So like I mentioned, we started our programming in Cambridge and Somerville, and we did a location feasibility study to find a town that had a lot of support for the arts, a lot of interest in the arts, but A, wasn't oversaturated, Mm -hmm. and B, was still missing some key infrastructure to support the local creative community. 
Uh, and we looked all over the, I mean, we looked at New Bedford and Providence and Worcester and Lynn and Lowell and Beverly was thrown on the list by one of our board of directors about two and a half years ago, which is when we were doing this study. Mm -hmm. And what we found in Beverly and what I've continued to find over the past two and a half years is that the wheel of the arts community is here. Mm -hmm. It's strong, as you know, the organizations show. There's a lot of great programming already happening here. Yeah. But I think there's a missing hub okay. at let's, the center of the let's wheel. Let's show that. Let's show that. All right, and there's the missing, and that's BevArt. That's BevArt. Oh, okay. So we want to create a place. All of these organizations have their specific missions. You know, mm -hmm. Montserrat College of Art is a college. It provides high-quality educational programming to arts students. Yeah. Its mission isn't to do community art programming, yeah. and that's the mission that we want to do. We want to support all of the people who are either coming to town because of these wonderful arts organizations but might not necessarily know they're coming to Beverly, right. right? They're coming. I went to go see a show at the Warner Theater, which is somewhere in Connecticut, and I can tell you I saw the Indigo Girls. I can tell you I went to Warner Theater. I have no idea what town it was in. <laughs> and so these arts organizations are doing great work. They're yeah. bringing people here, and we want to take that momentum and connect it directly to the local artists who live here. Right. Now, uh, let's let's talk a little bit about, uh, we're not going to get into the weeds here financially and get too detailed, but tell us about the, the, your financial model and, and how you're going to support this. And maybe we could, as you, as you mentioned this, we can put the next slide up, okay? Sure. So, I mean, what's really wonderful about this work is that it's sustainable. Mm -hmm. Artist Studio Spaces is a sustainable, proven business model. So it's very simple. You take the cost of operating the space, and I've talked with the public school district, and I've talked with people who've been in the building, and so we estimate that it's about $600,000 to run the building every year. Mm -hmm. And that includes the gigantic gas bill, that includes maintenance, that includes the staff. And then you take the rentable square foot. So even though Briscoe Middle School is 144,000 square feet, we estimate that only about 75,000 of it is rentable. The rest is the auditorium and circulation yeah, and mechanical. Right. right. Um, and so we did a market study, and we decided that right now our cost projection is about $12 per square foot, which would put us at one of the most affordable studio rates in the area, right, right at the bottom of the market rate for anything in the area. Right. Um, and if you do that math, you get $900,000 of income from yep. the space to cover $600,000 of expenses. Right. Now, let's let's talk you you had net capital um, uh, net before capital investment. Let's see the next slide because because the building is as everybody knows, it's it's it, 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 it's the poster child for deferred maintenance. There's a lot it's of a uh, lot that needs to be done. So, uh, tell us a little bit about how you plan uh, to do that. Absolutely. So, I think one of the things that makes this proposal possible is that if you don't change the use of the building or the zoning of the building and we maintain educational public benefit, um, then we don't have to bring the building up to code compliance right away. Okay. That doesn't mean that we don't want to do it. It means that instead of needing around 7 to $9 million to walk in the door, we can create a 10-year capital improvement campaign and use that $300,000 that was a net profit right. and invest that back into the building over the yeah. course of time. Mm -hmm. And what that means is not only do we make those important code compliance uh, improvements, but it also means that as we continue to go, it's not bing bang one big improvement it's a scheduled scaffolded way to make mm -hmm. sure that the art center actually has improvements for its longevity yeah and and obviously you're going to have to stack rank what you do first and what yes. you do second and this will all be uh, you know things need to be in compliance so uh, you need to be very careful about what you do, what you fix to be in compliance with sure. codes and things like well, that. Well, and I mean, I think code compliance is really important. The most important thing is safety. And yeah. so the reason this building isn't completely up to code is not necessarily because it's not safe, but because it was built before the current codes were put in place. Yeah. Right. So there were different qualities that you had to bring it up to code. And right. we want it to be modern and we want it to be completely compliant now. Mm -hmm. But we recognize that the way to make this happen is to do it in a long term. Right. So I've been talking with people who worked in the building when it was school and asking, what's the number one concern? You know, what comes first, what comes second, yeah, yeah. Uh, and trying to make sure, okay, can we fix this within a three-year timeline, or should this be within the seven-year timeline, and really get a grasp. Uh, and then, in our budget, we included a healthy maintenance line, because, of course, if you are continuing to defer maintenance, yeah. it is more expensive to run the building, yeah. but we can do it. 
And yeah. that's what's important. Right. Now, let's, you, you had an interesting concept you talked about before by, by pre-getting um, leases, pre-signed. So let's, let's put the next slide up, the uh, pre, uh, pre-development um, cost, and, and talk about that a little bit, Miranda. Sure. So I think one of the most exciting things about the pre-development costs is if we don't change the use or the zoning, which means we don't have to bring it up to code, we can actually get in the building for under $500,000 in under six months, which means that instead of a lengthy development, fundraising, financing, construction, and then occupancy process, which would take multiple years, we could immediately turn this valuable piece of property into a really vital community center for both the specific Ward 3 area Beverly more broadly and honestly throughout the North Shore. Mm -hmm. So our way to do that is to identify potential artists who would be interested in leasing space and our goal is to get a hundred percent pre-commitment before Mm -hmm. we even get the building. Mm -hmm. So we'll ask those artists first to tell us if they're interested. Second, we'll go through the space with them ideally and ask them to sign leases if they're interested and then give deposits. So that would give us a cash reserve with which we could then go to a bank and say two hundred artists gave us $500 as a deposit on their space, which means we have a cash reserve of about $100,000. We need $500,000 to open the building. And we're going to have $300,000 in profit every year every once year, we're yeah. open. Yeah. So that's something you can walk up to a bank with. And even though it's not quite what they're used to, it's yeah. a good business plan. Now, where, where would you find these artists? Where would you go to, 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 to locate these artists that you're talking about? Well, it's actually, I just yesterday, I published our Interested Artist Survey. Mm-hmm. And within the first eight hours through social media channels, through the network that we've been building, through community programming, over 60 people applied within the first six hours. Mm-hmm. And so that demonstrates to me the incredible need mm-hmm. that's here. I mm-hmm. mean, every single artist studio space on the North Shore is full. Yeah. The turnover is incredibly low. If you talk to 222 Cabot Street, if you talk to Porter Mills, if you talk to Cedar Tree up in Amesbury, every place is full. And yeah. they're expensive yeah. because when there's that high demand, you can push up the rent. Well, I was going to ask you, t- tell us a bit more about that because um, uh, th- there seems to be, uh, the layman would say, gee, we seem to have a lot of artists, uh, you know, uh, 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 locations around here. But you're telling me that space is at a premium. Is that, is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, there, I mean, going back to that wheel, there are a lot of great arts programming. But there is not infrastructure to support professional working artists. And people, you know, once you're out of Montserrat and you're an alum living in Beverly, where do you go? There really isn't an answer right now. Porter Mills is chock full. There's a long wait list. And it's great that they're there. They show, you know, the interest in town. But there's so much more need. Uh, than now, what's in that building. Now, somebody's going to say, you know, uh, artists usually are thought of as being, you know, kind of like like off-the-wall flaky people <laughs> and, and trying to get leases signed beforehand and get people to commit to, you know, uh, you're taking kind of a risk, but you don't feel that way. Not at all. I mean, I'm an artist myself, and I do think that's a stereotype we need to overcome. <laughs> I always remind artists that until the Industrial Revolution, every artist was a business person. You yeah. know, Michelangelo was not just doing divine inspiration. He was doing a commission. Yeah. He was a businessman. Yeah. And so artists actually have that, and we need to change the narrative. So it's not about art versus business, but about them working together. Mm-hmm. And I think right now that's happening. I mean, the creative entrepreneurship field is expanding. The fact that the gatekeeper level has dropped away and now artists can create their own stores, their own galleries on the internet. I think all of that is encouraging artists to be better business people. But even before that, going back to my time at the Umbrella, I mean, artist space, affordable, good artist space is so rare that once you get your hands on it, you do not let go. Yeah. And that's why at the Umbrella, their turnover rate was one about every year and a half. And of the 55 artists in the building, at least 10 of them had been there since 1983. Mm-hmm. And so I, that's why I know about the mittens. That's why I know because I spoke to the artists who'd been working in that building for three and a half decades. Yeah. And so I think not only are artists reliable, they're innovative, they're creative, but there is such a need that once they get in the space, they, they are responsible they, they, they and wanna, they make sure they can stay. They, they want to stay there. And um, now you, you also, we didn't mention this, you are looking for the city to lease you the space for a dollar, mm-hmm. correct? 
So uh, I guess the question might be, you know, uh, what is what does the city get out of this? Sure, the city gets a very strong cultural community center. They get to become the wheel and the hub for the arts community across the North Shore. They'll be the largest, if we were to get this building, it would be the largest artist studio space in Essex County. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at what Lowell has done with their Western Ave studios, yeah. they have over 300 artists in the mill building there and it yeah. has changed the city. Yeah. And so there's the public benefit, but there's also the economic benefit of being known as the arts hub, of having people come here because of the Cabot, because of North Shore Music Theater, and then saying, oh, I want to stay here. I want to experience these artists. I want to get to know this community. That's a place I want to go back to. Yeah. So we would have a three-pronged approach in terms of supporting the community. We would create infrastructure to support the local professional artists. Okay. And remember, 200 artists is 200 small businesses. Sure. Right? So these are people who are making work, selling work, engaging in the community, living in the community. And so while there isn't a direct revenue off of the building itself, I think it takes vision to see that the community benefit and the economic benefit creates a ripple effect throughout the throughout entire the, community. Yeah, yeah. So not only is it professional artists, but by having all of these artists in the building, making sure it stays publicly accessible, we would be creating an access point for the entire community to reconnect with their creativity, mm -hmm. which is something that unfortunately is not encouraged. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and we'd be creating a way for all of these tourists who are already coming to Beverly, who are coming to Salem, who are coming to the North Shore in general, to connect with the people who are making things here and not, you know, that get to experience the wonderful shows of the national artists being put on in these quality theaters, and then they get to meet the people who are actually making things yeah. in this town. Yeah. Yeah, very, very compelling story. Yeah, very compelling story, Miranda. Thank you. Now, uh, you, you have done, the next slide, you, you've talked a little bit about some of the community outreach that, that you mm -hmm. have done. Um, and let's see if you can amplify on that a little bit more. Tell us. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about, let, maybe we can talk about that now, and, and we'll also show the next slide. Uh, this is the tiny house. That's right. And this was in Beverly uh, last summer, correct? Yeah, July. Uh, and it was right across, in the little lot there on the Montserrat campus, right across from the library. Mm -hmm. And you actually live in that house. That is your do. domicile. That is yes. where you live, correct? That's correct. Uh, and in fact, there there's the, the picture. So that is you <laughs> inside that little house. Now, you are, where are you right now? Where's the little house at now? Right now, it's out near Lowell, okay. which is why I'm connected with that arts community uh -huh. there a little bit. Yeah. And now, and you uh, you had when you were here for what about a month? Uh, uh, how many people came through the through the house? We had thirteen hundred people walk through the front door. Uh huh. And I still, every single time I go to an event and I go to programming, I meet people who've been in my house. <laughs> what better to start what community organizing than literally to invite people into your home? Yeah. And that's what the hearth is about. I mean, that's why it's Miranda's hearth, because I want you, I want Walt to come visit me. Yeah. I want you to walk through the door so I can say, hey, Walt. Welcome, yeah, yeah. welcome to the hearth. Yeah, no, that, that that's quite that's a great concept. Uh, now, uh, if people want to um, uh, get in touch with you mm -hmm. and get in touch with Miranda's hearth, we have a let's see, we have a website, phone number, and some email. Let's let's get that up on the screen. Um, so, www.mirandashearth.com. And that number, 203-979-9268. Now, where does that ring? Where, where, who's number? That rings directly to me. That's your, that's your number. So people, there's no middleman there. No. They'll, they'll, they'll get directly to you. So mirandashearth.com. And I think there's also an email address that we can show. Yeah. And um, email, it's miranda at mirandashearth.com. Hearth. Make sure you say hearth, not That's hearth. Right. Yeah, hearth. <laughs> Although hearth is part of it, as as we said. Yeah. So, um, the the RFP, as we said, uh, for this project, the Briscoe project, is not out yet. It should be out right. shortly. We're sitting here. It's uh, May second, I think, to May third, yep. something like that. May second. Uh, and it should be out. And. Uh, and uh, you have all these activities that you're planning for, for right, Beverly? Right, right. I mean, what we're trying to do is create a groundswell because the way we'll put the, pull this off is if we get enough people involved, if we get enough people to say, 
I want to be able to walk through the doors of that building and sit yeah. down and experience the art and meet my local community and make something. Yeah. Or I want to rent space from this building. Yeah. So if people want to get involved, we're just trying to build that support network now. That's yeah. why we do our weekly community nights. Right now they're Thursdays on May 15th. They'll move to Wednesdays because okay. I realized I was accidentally hosting events on the art opening night. Okay. Thursdays are always art opening. So uh, we've been moving to Wednesdays at Waring Downtown in the Cabot. And anybody, if they have questions about the project or if they just want to come and, and make something and experience an informal, safe, creative community that's welcoming, they can come and experience that with us. We're also doing larger events. So we've got our Nourish Beverly Festival. Yeah, tell us about that. I think yeah. we, did we have a slide on that? We do. Uh, uh, yeah, let's see if we can go back a slide or two, the Nourish Beverly, and talk about that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So Nourish Beverly will take there place on June 1st. It's at the Hale Farm, and we're really excited to be partnering with Historic Beverly to celebrate local food, history, art, and music. Okay. We will also have a beer garden provided by Gentile Brewery. Okay. So we're going to have music, live arts demonstrations, free art activities. The Hale House will be open for free tours. Okay. There'll be food there. And the goal is just to get people out and enjoying their creative community and demonstrating the kind of programming that we could offer at BevArt. Yeah. And now the the Tiny House Festival, fifth That's annual. Right. I didn't even know that there had been four before this. Yes. And are, you're going to have your house in this festival? I am. Yeah. Well, I organized the festival. Ah. It's our fifth one. Okay. And where and where is this? happening? Where is that? This one's going to be at the North Shore Music Theater. So uh -huh. working with another another spoke on the wheel. Okay. And, and there will be other tiny houses there? Yep. Yep. Our goal is to have at least 10 to 15 houses. You know, they are people's homes. So I'm reaching out to everyone right now to see where are you going to be? Are you yeah. up for coming to the festival? And But I find that it's really exciting. I mean, for me, the point of the tiny house movement is, is not to convince everyone to live in 160 square feet, which is what I live in. <laughs> the goal is to get people to think about how they are living and why they live that way. Yeah. And I think that's a theme that runs through Miranda's hearth, through my work as a professional artist. Um, you mentioned before we got on air the, the book that I wrote called Don't Make Art, Just yeah. Make Something. That's right. We didn't mention that earlier. T give us the title again. Sure. It's called Don't Make Art, Just Make Something. And there, there, tell us the, the reasoning behind the, the, the title, because I think it's a fascinating title to, to a book. What, what are you, you trying to tell people? Well, I, I say it as somebody who thought for the first half of my life that I could not be an artist. Yeah. Because we fall into these categories when we're children and the people who can run fast become the athletes and the people who test well become the academics and yeah. the people who draw realistically with a pencil they're the ones who get to become the artists. Yeah. And I think that's changing, and it's changing because people are realizing that art is a broader term. Sure. And so this was actually my master's thesis at Lesley University, and I started talking as a teacher about the fact that if you always try and make museum-worthy pedestal-level capital A art. You won't go anywhere. You won't make anything at all. And <laughs> yeah, that's true for professional you're artists. Just spinning your wheels. And yeah. it's true for people who are picking up a pencil for the first time. Yeah, yeah. You know, so I think what the way you end up making art is by just making something. Just making something. That's no. why I thought I could build my own house. I had no construction experience <laughs> before I built my tiny house. But I figured if I can make something every day, Eventually, all of those somethings come together and make a house. Yeah, there you go. Well, this this has been uh, this has been a fascinating uh, conversation, uh, Miranda, and I want to thank you for coming by, and uh, I'd like to thank my guest, Miranda Ashleen, uh, who wants to start off a, a um, Bev Art hub here in uh, in uh, the Garden City. Thank you, uh, Miranda, for being my guest. Of course. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and I'd like to remind our viewers that you've been watching North Shore Journal. I'm your host, Walt Kosmowski, and we'll see you next time.